Good evening. Welcome to the 10th annual Beloit College Duffy Community Partnership Colloquium Lecture. It's hard to believe that it's been 10 years, but indeed it has. My name is Carol Wickersham, and I have the honor as the coordinator of the Duffy, as it is fondly called on this campus, to be able to um, offer you warm greetings and also to take a few moments to say thank you to a number of important people that need to be thanked. Um, before introducing our speaker, I want to um, speak a few moments about those who make the partnerships possible. This program was conceived by the administration and faculty of this college, and in particular, my predecessor as coordinator of the partnerships, Professor Emily Chamley Wright. But also, most importantly, through the vision and generosity of alumnus James E. Duffy, whose guidance is still indispensable in keeping the partnerships on track. I want to say thank you also to my colleagues in the Liberal Arts and Practice Center and also the Sociology Department who are supporting this program in every possible way and are co-sponsoring tonight's lecture. The Duffy has evolved over the years into the program that it is now. It is a rigorous, hands-on, community-based sociology course with significant interdisciplinary input. The Duffy is organized around a central question, and that question is, what makes a good society? We explore this question from many angles, including this night's lecture. Each semester, approximately 15 students are placed at a dozen or so field sites out in the community to work with and learn from seasoned community leaders. In addition, two or more students every summer conduct in-depth research. This evening is one small way to thank all of those who make the Duffy possible. I call these people my colleagues as well as my partners. College and colleague obviously share the same linguistic root in Latin. It means those who are engaged in common work, not just in the toil and the task, but also in the shaping of what that work is, shoulder to shoulder, or as the Duffy motto puts it, hands on and heads engaged. And so I want to say thank you to my colleagues who come from many places, many disciplines, many different institutions. I want to most importantly thank those who have helped to make this year a success in terms of student learning. But not just in terms of learning, but also in helping those students engage in making this corner of the world a better place, just a bit more just and compassionate and prosperous and beautiful. And so first, I want to thank our community partners who mentor our students, providing them with an angle on education that the traditional classroom alone cannot provide. I also want to thank my faculty partners, whose wisdom and depth in their own disciplines and generosity with their time and expertise deepen student learning. But most of all, Especially, I want to thank the Duffy students, whom I regard as colleagues in training, colleagues in the future, and not the very distant future at that. Students who teach me every day, even as I teach them. I'm grateful for their energy, intelligence, insight, imagination, moral courage, and receptivity. I have no doubt that they are and will continue to create the good society. And finally, I have another two thank yous to the people who have really helped to shape this evening. My two wonderful student colleagues in the Office of Community-Based Learning, and I invite them to come up here. Lena Simpson-Wright and Matthew Waltheus. Lena and Matt did much of the legwork for this evening, including work with college archivist Fred Burwell to assemble examples of campus and community involvement in social movements from the civil rights through the Occupy movement, 
in display at the College Library, as well as on the PowerPoint tonight. And now I turn the podium over to Matt to introduce Dr. Jasper. James Jasper attended Harvard College, where he received his BA in economics, followed by a master and PhD in sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. Since 2007, he has taught sociology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has also taught at New York University, Columbia, Princeton, and the New School for Social Research. He's a former editor of Context Magazine, published by the American Sociological Association, in which he published the column called The Fool, where he wrote tongue-in-cheek articles regarding contemporary society. He is author and editor of several short publications and 10 books, including The Art of Moral Protest and editor of The Oxford Studies in Culture and Politics. Though he says on his website that he costs $319, the price of his hospital bill from when he was born, his edited book of the social movements, critical concepts, and sociology costs over $1,300 for a used copy on Amazon, about 75 cents a page. I think you'll agree with me, his visit here is priceless, and please join me in welcome, welcoming our 10th annual Duffy Colloquium speaker in his speech, Protest and the Search for Social Justice in Beloit, the U.S., and the World, James Jasper. Uh, thank you, Matt and Lena, for that introduction and for the very hard work that went into the slideshow that's going to accompany my talk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Duffy, for funding this wonderful program for a decade now. And thanks especially to Carol for inviting me here tonight. Uh, and I can only marvel that um, she believes a proper thank you to all the partners is to invite you here to sit through an hour-long academic lecture. <laughs> Hats off to all of you. <laughs> it's now been more than 50 years ago that Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington. This is the culmination of increasing national and international attention to the civil rights movement, a recognition that it was the legitimate voice of black Americans and the symbol of a moral problem that could no longer be ignored. Within two years, we had the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Acts. Of course, within several years, we also had riots in almost all American cities in which inner city blacks uh, expressed their continuing outrage at their status and treatment in American society. 50 years is a long time. Politically, we live in a very different world today in which an African-American can be elected president of the United States, in which Eastern Europe has rejoined Western Europe after decades of communist rule, in which old-fashioned colonies, which were still widespread uh, 50 years ago, have largely disappeared. In intellectual terms, 50 years is also a long time. That's two or three intellectual generations, if we think of these generations as distinct ways of seeing the world, of explaining things, in this case of explaining protest. The Civil Rights Movement contributed directly to the first big intellectual shift. In the 1960s, a young generation of American scholars began to think about protesters differently from how they had been taught. They began to think of them as reasonable, even noble people, pursuing their natural interests in material advancement and political and human rights. In contrast, what they had been taught in the 1950s, more or less, was that protesters go a little crazy when you put them in crowds. They do aggressive things they wouldn't normally do. Uh, that they are alienated from their society and their communities, and that they use politics and activism as a, re as a way to repair their own self-images, uh, to figure out who they are, uh, to make new friends. In other words, in the 1950s, the standard thinking had been that protesters were damaged people, 
whether narcissists or social isolates or misanthropes. But no one could think that anymore after looking at the civil rights protesters. The earnest preachers in their blue suits, uh, the young men in white ties, uh, white, white, uh, white shirts, ties, and jackets, uh, the young women in their best skirts and dresses, the older women in their church hats. There's never been a more sympathetic group of protesters or more normal. They came from every occupation in the black community, from every age group. They were the entire community mobilized for justice. They showed us, um, they showed all of us that people don't protest because they're crazy, but because they're oppressed. Not because they're alienated from other people, but because they're connected to others. The great change was that protest now appeared a reasonable thing to do, even a cool thing to do. Even Americans living far from the rural south, such as Beloit, wanted to help in whatever ways they could. So for example, in 1964, white and black students came from all over the country to Freedom Summer, taking serious risks in doing so. The Civil Rights Movement also fits scholars' views of historical progress, in which one group after another demands and eventually gains inclusion in the political system, in which one human rights abuse after another is challenged and eventually ended. Well, in the US, the riots started just as the Civil Rights Movement ended. In fact, beginning only two weeks after the Civil Rights Act was signed. But the same new way of seeing things was applied to the riots. These were not alienated, isolated individuals. These were not criminals looking for a chance to steal a television. These were regular people outraged at how society treated them, effectively blocked from normal political channels and economic opportunities, and ready to take risks to show how angry they were about that. Yes, they were mostly young men, always perceived in the media as a dangerous category, especially when they're black. But these were young men who were well connected in their communities, who went to church, who were politically engaged. These were not criminals. In fact, a lot of research was done checking to see if they had arrest records, if you can believe it. It turns out they did not, but this was the, the expectation that if you were a rioter, you must be a criminal. They're not unlike the young men burning cars in France a decade ago, or those rioting in Britain five or six years ago. And yet over time, the riots have been written out of the historical narrative, distinguished from the civil rights movement. The southern civil rights movement was noble. The, nationalist, uh, the, the northern black nationalist movement was dangerous and criminal. Martin Luther King Jr. was fine. Malcolm X and the Black Panthers were not. And most of all, nonviolence is beautiful, violence is ugly. The riots didn't exactly fit with the new paradigm of calculating rational people demanding their rights largely without passions. Now not only media and scholars, but later social movements helped to rewrite this history and taking riots out of the history. Uh, the movements, the most dominant social movements of the 1970s and 1980s, uh, like feminism, gay and lesbian rights, ecology, anti-nuclear movements, uh, the sanctuary movement, were all strongly nonviolent and began, in fact, to deny the violent movements in U.S. history. That had often had a big impact. Because there's a lot of evidence that the riots had more of an effect than the polite civil rights movements in the, the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Anyway, we have two classic models of protesters. In one, they're crazy or made crazy when they join crowds. They're disconnected. They're either disconnected from others, loners, unsure of their own personal identities, or they're too connected, following the whim of the crowd automatically without thinking about what they're doing in a kind of group mind.
Psychoanalysis added the unfortunate idea that protesters were not dealing with the real world at all, but were using politics to work out their own internal psychic dramas, Oedipal struggles, for instance, or their own narcissism. Well, this older psychological model, as I mentioned, was replaced in the 1960s by a more economic model in which people are rational, pursuing their individual interests through a variety of political channels, some of them inside the political system and some of them outside it. At the level of organizations in this view, protest groups are like corporations. Again, rationally trying to mobilize resources and make something like a profit. Now this economic model that emerged is a bit more respectful of people than the psychological model but never quite respectful enough, since it makes people into caricatures, always out for their own selfish benefits. They aren't crazy, in this model at least, but they're not very admirable either. Now as always happens in paradigm shifts, much was gained, but something was also lost. What disappeared was any attention to psychology, to culture, to emotions, to how collective identities help construct political players. We lost any sense of grievances, that people have reasons for what they do. They have goals, things they want. If GM closes a factory and fires people, they are rightly upset about that. If you take away people's right to form unions, they are outraged. Now the anger and frustration are obvious in something like a riot, but they're also there in almost all protest. They just don't appear in these organizational economic models that became, began to dominate and dominated in the 1970s and 1980s. More recently, better images of protesters have begun to emerge, more accurate as well as more empathic. Models of people who are connected to the world around them in all sorts of ways, embedded in the world around them. And this third generation of scholars of the last 20 years see protesters as connected first through shared cultural meanings, understandings. The way we understand the world is something we share with others. It's not an internal, weird, psychological idiosyncrasy. And this includes moral visions. The new image sees people as driven by moral intuitions and principles, not just by self-interest. It also sees protesters as connected through social networks, interacting with, communicating with others in regular ways, following regular patterns, uh, purposive uh, politics. People also develop collective identities with which they identify with larger groups. They feel part of larger collectivities to such an extent that they're willing to sacrifice for the sake of the group. And these identifications with the group are among the deepest human satisfactions. Because identifications, loyalties like this, emotions like this also connect us to the world around us. Emotions are, in fact, reactions to the world around us and what happens to us in that world. They're not, as the Freudians would have it, eruptions that suddenly bubble up from inside us at inappropriate times. For the most part, we have emotions that are appropriate to the situation we're in. So in all these ways, we've come to see politics as ongoing interactions, relationships, engagements among various players who may cooperate, who may compete with each other in a variety of strategic arenas over long periods of time. So just as the civil rights movement showed us that protesters can be rational, not criminal or crazy. It was the women's movement and the gay and lesbian rights movements that helped us think about collective identities, about the emotions of politics, about the networks that tie people together. Every major social movement, every major new movement inspires new ways for scholars to think about all movements, to see new aspects and processes in them that they've missed in the past. The excitement of a new movement translates into excitement in the study of social movements. So if we think of this connected view as a, a, a third model, 
and compare it to the psychological and economic models, we can see how useful protest is as a kind of laboratory for understanding human action in general. We can work, by looking at social movements, we can work out whether humans are disturbed and irrational, whether they are rational, self-interested actors, or whether they are culturally, morally, and emotionally connected to each other. Reasonable, without overdoing it. Emotional, without necessarily overdoing it. Or perhaps they're a combination of all three. Again and again, social scientists come back to social movements because they're the essence of social life and that people come together to solve problems. They devote time and money to some collective purpose. They coordinate their actions with other people. This is what social life is all about. So protest helps us ask, what are people like? And what, why do they do what they do? Now, not only does protest tell us what it's like to be human in general, it's also a very characteristic human activity. People have always found ways to complain, to protest, and sometimes to change what they don't like. Even when people are very tightly watched, very tightly controlled, like slaves, peasants, they find ways to sabotage, to burn down barns, to disrupt their master's operations in all sorts of ways. There's nothing more human than protesting. But a protester is not some unusual kind of person. It could be any of us. We all care about something deeply enough that we would take to the streets to protect it if it were threatened. Protesters are those of us who are lucky enough to have found that cause, to be able to live out their deepest moral commitments. As I said, emotions are a central part of what it is to be human, and so they have a central part in this new vision of protest and of, of humanity. Emotions link us to a series of contexts. Urges such as hunger and pain link us to our own bodies. Reflex emotions like anger and fear link us to events in our immediate physical environment. Long-term affective bonds such as love or trust or respect animate our relationships to a very broad social environment, symbolic as well as physical. And finally, moral emotions like shame or indignation also relate us to a very broad symbolic world. Emotions show why we would care enough about the world to act in it, to engage in political action at all. People go out into the street because they're outraged, not because they calculate that they can get more money that way, not because they're blindly following the crowd. So emotions connect us thoroughly with the several worlds around us, which is why, in the end, emotions promise the most fundamental rethinking of human action, overcoming all sorts of dualisms of structure and action, of rational and irrational, that have misled social scientists for so long. Many scholars continue to contrast thoughts with emotions as though emotions were irrational eruptions that disrupt our actions and disrupt our pure thoughts, a form of the old mind versus body contrast. They exaggerate how irrational and arbitrary and embodied our emotions are. Emotions have been treated as automatic instincts and responses over which we have no control. Political elites have used this contrast to their advantage. They've always contrasted emotions with rationality, and their purpose has always been to exclude various groups from governing. Slaves, women, the working class, immigrants, have all been dismissed as too emotional to participate, too emotional to vote, too emotional to even be fully human. Well, obviously I have a different view. Emotions are vital to how we think, how we evaluate, how we act, how we function in the world. And in fact, the trend in psychology in the last decade or two has been to understand this, to understand um, that cognition itself depends on emotions, and emotions themselves can be thoughtful, wise, uh, functional even. We see this in terms uh, like emotional intelligence, which has become a popular uh, buzzword lately. 
I think this all reflects over the last several decades women's greater participation in politics, in management, in public life more generally. This new paradigm can acknowledge that we feel our way through the world, uh, little by little, gropingly, um, not always consciously, and that we pursue a variety of projects based on how we think and feel. So emotions permeate strategy, uh, but strategy also permeates emotions. We control our displays of anger to present ourselves as a certain kind of person calm and under control, not threatening, or maybe we try to provoke the police into anger, uh, looking brutal on television, uh, something that's all too easy to do. Activists know all sorts of techniques for arousing various kinds of emotions and discouraging other kinds. They do this constantly. It's almost uh, what the job of an activist is. In fact, emotions are central to democracy. Democracy is not simply about giving people formal rights. It also has to do with how they feel about one another. And the essence of democracy, I would say, is to have compassion for other people, to feel that their humanity is equal to ours. So for example, the young immigrant students known as dreamers have been very successful, I think, because they've inspired a lot of admiration and compassion. Uh, as hardworking, aspiring, and blameless kids. Of course, the risk of that is that other immigrants, including sometimes their parents, uh, can be portrayed as lawbreakers who made a choice to do something illegal. So more compassion for one group always means less compassion for another. But compassion isn't enough in democracy because we can't just give oppressed people something. It's an important part of human dignity that they take it for themselves. They demand it. Political action, assertion of our rights, is a part of being human. It gives a feeling of empowerment, a confidence that you really belong. You're not just being given certain these rights. And this is another difference in these three ways of viewing protest. An economic vision would say that people protest when they're disadvantaged, when they're unemployed, when they're poor. But decades of deindustrialization here in Wisconsin and in Beloit, uh, including <clears throat> the highest unemployment rates in Wisconsin at time, from time to time, this isn't necessarily enough to generate protest. Suffering is not enough. In addition, you need to be outraged, indignant, angry. And for that, you need to be able to blame someone. If you see unemployment as a force of nature, uh, there's no one to blame. But if you see it as a result of political and especially corporate decisions, choices to move to lower wage parts of the country and the world, you see that things could have been different or could be different. And that some corporate executives have made choices. Then you can be angry. Then you can organize to try to do something. The emotions are what get people into the streets, not some economic calculation of advantage or disadvantage. If you're fired, you might end up blaming yourself. On the other hand, if your entire plant is closed down, you can't really blame yourself. You might start thinking about corporate policies. That's why politicians often try to avoid responsibility try to blame their decisions on external constraints. Scott Walker didn't just say, oh, I hate unions. He said, uh, well, we can't afford them. They're forcing us to raise property taxes. Uh, the state debt is too high, and it's just forcing me to do this. Um, it was all about structural constraints, uh, he claimed. Um, and not all of those claims, I think, turned out to be true. Well, to sum up, the intellectual trend across these different paradigms has been to move from a, a distant uh, Olympian view of protests or hovering above reality to a vision much closer to the ground, more realistic, more accurate, in which we can appreciate what it's really like to be a protester. Most scholars of social movements today have been protesters, something that was not true in the 1950s. 
which says a lot about the, the shift in the role of the university in American society, I think. So we've seen a kind of convergence between the views of scholars and the point of view of protesters themselves about what they do. This is an improvement, no doubt, but it also has its own risks, especially when it comes to asking hard questions about successful and unsuccessful strategies. Scholars don't necessarily have to be as upbeat as organizers usually have to be. But scholars always need to apply what I call the normal person test to the people they study. Are we explaining what they do in ways that we would use to account for our own actions? In other words, as if they are normal people just like us. If not, if we're explaining them as inherently damaged, inherently weird, or even inherently heroic in some superhuman way, then we might want to rethink our explanations. Because in the end, protesters are normal people, just like you and me. In many cases, they are you and me. A lot of scholars um, are also more politically motivated, rather than just trying to explain things, they want to change things. And they will worry that so much attention to emotions will, will, will still make protesters seem irrational, the way they appeared in the 1950s. Since this is, after all, a perspective that you still find fairly often in the media. But what do we owe the people we study, if not, first, honesty? the truth about what the causes of action really are. Second, we also owe them respect. And what better way to respect them than to start from where they start, to get inside their heads, to appreciate their passions and their goals and their frustrations. In other words, to treat them like complex human beings, just like us. The problem with the theories of the 1950s was not that they turned to psychology, but that they got the psychology wrong. An oversimplified, pejorative psychology. And we owe it to the protesters we study to get it right. And only then can we appreciate the vital role that protest plays in every modern society. Helping us articulate our basic values, to feel solidarities with our fellow humans, and to work out solutions to the hideous problems that we all face. Thank you. Uh, we'll take questions, and I'm told I have to stay here um, to take questions, which feels really awkward. Um, but um, for purposes of streaming this, I. I have to stand here where I can't even see most of you because of the light in my face. Hi, thank you. I have several questions. Actually, I have at least two. Um, it seems now our demonstrations are becoming environmental demonstrations, and I don't see us winning them. And I'm wondering if it's because we're not just demonstrating against the government, we're just uh, demonstrating against the corporations and people like um, the Koch brothers, that sort of thing, and, and that, that really concerns me. So I think many of our um, problems are now trying to save the um, environment. And again, they're trying to make these people look like they're weird, they're odd, they're emotionally attached to the environment when they should be attached to money and um, business and those sorts of things. So I'm kind of wondering where you think we're going to be going with those demonstrations. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I, it's, it's astounding to me we don't have more environmental protests than we do. And um, I, I think it has been corporate campaigns that have sort of worked this little crack, uh, very tiny crack in the consensus of the scientific community about a lot of environmental issues, most obviously global warming. And they've put a wedge in that and made it seem as though uh, to a lot of people who, uh, to a lot of Americans who mistrust scientists to start with, uh, that there's really no consensus and this is all made up. And it's amazing to me uh, that they've been able to do this. Um, so uh, I, why we don't have even more protest about that, 
I think it's very frustrating because it's not, it seems like an overwhelming problem. And so the, I think the emotional dynamic is uh, it feels better in a way to deny it because it feels so frustrating to go out and protest against something that's so overwhelming. But clearly it's a political issue. We're not going to stop global warming by you know, everybody buying a smaller car and recycling and winterizing our houses better. As good as all those things are, we're only going to stop global warming when governments around the world uh, uh, pass policies that, you know, with carbon taxes and so on. Um, and uh, you know, it's frustrating why there's not more uh, protest about that because it's a pretty big, pretty big issue. So you talk in your book, The Art of Moral Protest, a little bit about um, the phenomenon of, um, or the idea that, that the marginalized voice is somehow the truer voice. Um, I'd be interested to hear you comment on that, especially in, and maybe um, in the context of contemporary social movements. So you say, um, you know, when revolutions are won and the what was the marginalized voice now takes the seat of power, um, there's no longer that like ring of truth to it. Um, does that mean that protesters should aim to, you know, as protesters do, subvert the tendency to to take over power? Or yeah, can just comment on that. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I think we understand the world better, more fully, when there are dissenting voices. Whenever there's a consensus uh, and we lose that dissent, we're in trouble, I think. So protest, I think, always serves the function of questioning, challenging the accepted truth. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't say there's any particular group in society who's necessarily got a got a, uh, a stranglehold on the truth. What they have is what we need is is disagreement. We need conflict, and because that's where you get people to sort of get evidence to argue against each other. Usually, I mean that's how science, at least, is supposed to work. Um, politics, not so much, uh, but at least in theory dissent is going to challenge the, the, the truths. Um, when protesters get into power, um, some other protesters are going to come along and, and criticize them for one thing or another. So there's never any shortage of grievances out there, I think. And it's, it's very healthy that we have one wave after another coming along, because that's uh, usually uh, progress. Um, not always. Depends on who takes power. Um, fascists. The Nazis started as a protest movement, after all. So protesters aren't all good, uh, clearly. But we don't get any progress without them. Let's put it that way. They're they're necessary but not sufficient uh, conditions for progress towards social justice. I would say. Um, hi. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk more about um, kind of like nonviolent protests versus um, non nonviolent, um, <laughs> and um, I guess particularly in like the eco terrorism kind of realm of things, um, and like what you think is like effective, so called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. First of all, let's, uh, there, let's make some distinctions uh, in the so-called violent category, right? Because um, breaking the law is one thing. Breaking store windows is another thing. Breaking people's bones is a third very different thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of movements would be happy enough. I mean, most movements today do break the law. That's what civil disobedience is all about. A number of them are happy enough when there is occasionally a little bit of property damage. Uh, very few say hurting people is a good thing. Um, so, but even the property damage, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a dilemma. Um, nothing gets the attention of the media and of government authorities faster than a few broken Starbucks windows. 
Um, on the other hand, it brings, tends to bring down repression pretty fast too. So for, for uh, you put it well, non-nonviolent tactics to work, I don't want to call them violence because I'm saving that for violence against humans, but for really disruptive tactics to work, uh, you have to scare the government or elites into concessions. Your tar- you have to scare your targets into concessions, and those concessions have to be irre- fairly irreversible. When they get the upper hand again, they can't just say, oh, well, we didn't mean it. Sorry. Um, so if you can intimidate a corporation into recognizing a union, that's relatively irreversible. <laughs> Not altogether, not as irreversible as we might like. Um, revolutions are another example. Once you've overthrown a dictator, that dictator is usually gone. There's still years of struggle over what the new government will be, but at least it's pretty rare for that regime to come back. So um, it's a high risk strategy, um, you know, because usually you just get repressed through these non nonviolent tactics. Uh, but sometimes you get what you want. And in fact, a lot of people have argued that the only way poor people, oppressed people, ever get any concessions is by shutting things down, is by disrupting politics, economic activity, and so on. And um, that seems right to me. Uh, I guess the main change I've been observing, at least in the time that I've been you know, politically active and aware, is that protests seem to be getting smaller and that the po- police uh, seem to be acquiring more tools for repressing them. And corporations and governments are increasingly immune to the whatever force we can bring to bear. Uh, our comrade near the top row mentioned uh, how... L- l- uh, how w- there's been so little one in terms of our environmental protests, and that also you know brings to mind the disproportionate response, the attention the FBI still puts to any environmental group. Uh, it seems to me that with th- the current you know uh, political and economic developments and decreasing strength of the protest, this is actually this. It seems to me this is becoming an irrelevant form of expression, much like any other. Uh, can you tell me I'm wrong? What's go? What? 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 What's? 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 What? What? What do you see as the future of the protest, given you know, given these developments? I mean, I think the 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 pepper spray image you put up there is quite effective. The students didn't win too many concessions, and the <laughs> agents of repression are pretty free with slapping them down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the, I think police have uh, gotten a lot cleverer in the last 10 or 15 years about how to manipulate crowds, how to corral them, uh, and, and control them. Um, I think the broader problems are, uh, you know, since the early 1980s, there's been a, such a, a strong backlash against the social gains of the 60s and, uh, and 70s. I mean, the backlash really began in the 70s, but. So it wasn't until Reagan's election when they sort of got the upper hand. Um, sadly, it showed. I mean, those the the right uh, began as a set of social movements, closely connected to the Republican Party, but still they were protest movements. Um, and it, you know, in a way, it shows the power of protest. It took American history in a direction that I don't like and you don't like, but. Um, they were very effective. For a long time, the right-wing movements were simply more effective than left-leaning movements, and we're living with that today, I think. Um, the other trend, other than the mobilization of the Christian right, uh, I, I think is, is the dominance of money, the increasing dominance of money in American politics. And uh, money outweighs voice and persuasion now to a huge degree in, in ways that it hasn't before. So, you know, we can understand this, we can explain it, but uh, I don't have anything particularly optimistic to say about it. Uh, It's a very depressing time. Oh, you ready? Okay, so you just said that um, basically money outweighs everything. So what does that speak for the future of 
our society if politics can be bought. Well, I think the, the real problem is that inequality has grown so fast recently. Um, and to put it in emotional terms, um, what that does, I think, is to kind of put a kind of a, a feeling of shame almost on people at the bottom and to uh, give a kind of um, confidence and arrogance to the people at the very, very top who now can sort of shamelessly buy political seats and have a huge influence in American politics. So, you know, as long as the underlying economic inequality remains so large and continues to grow, uh, we're going to have problems, and, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a social movement to reverse that. I mean, that's why o Occupy was so exciting to a lot of people because they were talking about inequality, and that was that was their main issue. It, they had some impact, I think, uh, in the media. The journalists, serious journalists, started talking about inequality. Uh, social commentators, social scientists are publishing a lot more books on inequality than they did five or ten years ago. So there's awareness in the sort of public sphere of, of debates. Um, but it's going to take a real social movement to translate that into political change and some kind of constraints, I think, some kind of reining in of this, this inequality. So, so if that awareness goes unacknowledged, then where do we stand? I'm sorry, say that again. So if that, oh, so if that rise of awareness goes unacknowledged by the masses, then what? <laughs> We're in trouble. Um, I mean, there's no re it, there, social movements start, there's some spark that, that starts them. There's something, they don't just emerge out of the goodwill of people. So, you know, the next financial crisis, we'll get another movement. I, I think the, the reason that Occupy wasn't even stronger than it was, was that a year before, the Tea Party had emerged and absorbed some of that anger that the Occupy movement that, you know, that should have gone to the left ended up being sucked off to the right. It seems to me that in American history there's a kind of populism that um, is suspicious of the rich, suspicious of banks, it's a sort of um, ideology of the hard-working American. And throughout American history this has swung sometimes to the right and sometimes to the left, back and forth. And we've had progressive eras when it swung to the left and mobilized large numbers of Americans. For the last, well since the 60s, it has been solidly on the right and that's why we're in a really depressing era, I think. And sometime it's going to have to swing back to the left. And hopefully it will. Okay, last question. So, what type of social movement would you suggest to start the fire instead of spark a match? It's going to take, I think, probably several together. If I had to pick one movement that I think it has, a, has really strong potential, it's a sort of classic rights-based movement, which is that of immigrants. Uh, documented and undocumented, uh, but it badly exploited. These are fundamental human rights issues, but they're also important economic issues. You know, so I think that has a lot of potential. Um, I thought that in 2006, of course, and you know, that's a, a while ago, and it hasn't quite panned out the way I, I hoped, but uh, it's, there's gonna have to be some sort of economically focused movement, I think, to, to at, at least stop the growing inequality and hopefully reverse it. But I don't have any magic solutions. Sure, so first, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come here and talk us about, about this, pro this, uh, this topic. Um, it's very um, intellectually inquisitive. Uh, so the second thing that I wanted to ask uh, was, you mentioned on your lecture that um, a lot of the people that are uh, start this type of protests are enraged by are, are usually minorities, uh, and then the, the reason that they go to this pro, uh, make this protest is because they've been enraged by uh, some 
sort of event uh, that they see or that they experience. However, in most of our everyday lives, we experience something or see something that enrages us, but not necessarily do we go all the way to create uh, a, a protest about it. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about what are some of the factors that um, sort of act as catalyst for this protest to happen, and also if ultimately these people uh, are able to get more people involved into this protest, do they, um, are these people can be considered as leaders and ultimately do they ex say, uh, exhibit more, more leadership or equal leadership skills as uh, someone in the executive office trying to motivate like uh, a group of people to uh, get involved in, in their cause that they believe in? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you have to be much more of a leader to mobilize people without money than when you have multi-million dollar budgets uh, to, to do things. Uh, you know, I think resources actually um, can make you strategically dumb because you don't need to be smart strategically if you have a lot of money. Right? If you don't have much money, you've got to be strategically smart. You've got to make good choices. Um, what kinds of things help outrage snowball? I mean, as I mentioned, blame. You know how you how you blame your your problems or understand your problems is crucial. Uh, you have to find individuals. I think you have to f find people. Basically, you have to find villains uh, to point to and say these people are screwing us over. Um, if you and you know, let's face it, the corporate world has invested a lot of time and energy into making us think that markets are just these natural phenomena over which we have no control, nobody has any control. Uh, jobs flow to Alabama or the Philippines and nobody ha can, can stop that. Um, we have to, in fact, insist that, no, there are decisions here that markets are heavily manipulated things. If, if they're not uh, constrained by politicians, they're going to be manipulated by corporations. Um, so the blame, I think, is, is really important. The other, another piece is you have to think that this is not just your problem, but there's a whole group of people or category of people whose problem this is, and so you feel solidarity with them. This is why it's very often minority groups of various kinds who can build this kind of collective identity to, to fight back. To, you know, so, you're, so you're outraged not just on your own behalf, but you're outraged on, beha on behalf of a whole group. That is a much more powerful moral um, feeling than just being upset for your own sake and for your own status. So those are, those are two central things, I think, blame and, and the sense of a group. Um, I was actually wondering, um, on the topic specific to the United States, I think there's a lot of talk of this generation specifically, like college age or the new people coming around, there's a lot of talk of apathy as being a main driver for no large protests happening. And I'm wondering if that's just something concocted by the media to try and pacify a generation, or if you actually think because of social media or slacktivism, um, apathy is actually something that is preventing these movements from happening. Yeah. Um, I don't see that. Uh, I think most people are apath fairly apathetic, or at least they're, they, don't, they haven't been given a good reason to become political yet. And I think that's true in most generations. Even in the famous 60s that we all sort of idealized, most students, most college students were not politically active. It was a minority then, uh, a larger minority than now. But um, there's all, there are always going to be issues that are going to come along and, and are capable of breaking that apathy. And I don't think uh, Facebook is going to prevent people from going out and protesting. In fact, scholars of social movements often point to Facebook as a way of mobilizing people, right? Especially like with the, the Egyptian revolution, people point to the Facebook pages and so on as a way of how, they, how people were gotten out into the streets. So, Technologies are tools that work for all sorts of purposes, one way or the other. So I, I'm not too worried about that. Um, apathy can disappear very quickly when things happen. I think we have had a um, 
robust and um, very informative conversation. Thank you so much um, for helping to spark this great um, opportunity to have discussions. So will you please join me in thanking Dr. Jasper? Coming out this evening. Um, travel safely back to your homes. <laughs> Thank you.